you are about to watch Standing Strong with Waylon Myers. This show is to encourage people that it's okay to talk about certain things to help lift them up and not they are strong. I hope you enjoy this show as I want to be real, honest, and expiring. This is Standing Strong with Waylon Myers. As I'm strong and I know my life is very important. Block out the bullies because your life is important. Welcome back to another episode of Standing Strong with Waylon Myers. I am very excited for this episode as the special guest is my cousin, Jeremiah Bucker. And before we get into his interview, I want to say, keep going in life as your life is very important. And now sit back and enjoy Jeremiah's episode of Standing Strong. And now, let me introduce to you the next guest on Standing Strong with Waylon Myers, Jeremiah Booker. What's up, Jeremiah? Hey, good evening. How are you? I am Devin away. Good. Can you share a little bit about yourself to the viewers? Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Jeremiah Barker. I am a pastor here in Abingdon, Illinois, um, as well as a junior, senior high Bible teacher at a Christian school, as well as their principal and guidance counselor. So I uh, got uh, many hats. I got a wife of going on 15 years and we have three children and um, yeah, just living life. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Were you the victim of bullying? If so, how did you overcome it? And if not, what advice would you give on bullying? Uh, yeah, so um, I never broke a hundred pounds until I was a sophomore in high school. Um, so you know, looking back now, I see where I was a pretty easy target. Mm -hmm. um, but also, um, I recognize uh, when I look back that I guess I asked for part of it, too, because um, some of my actions and my my words that I use towards people, I was almost instigating it and then surprised um, when it showed up, but uh, so for me, uh, elementary uh, was fine. I grew up in a small town there in Pennsylvania, and mm -hmm. and uh, it was it was fine. But then when we went to junior high, um, my class quickly went from you know twenty six students to a hundred and eighty students, mm -hmm. and. And so that was a big jump going from the country to, to the city school and being with everybody. And mm -hmm. so my, a, my small town, um, again, little kid, it, it was there. So um, a lot of it started there and it didn't end in junior high. It kind of carried on into high school. Um, so how I, thought I would overcome it was uh, I, I turned to drugs. I, I turned to a lifestyle that I thought I needed to have in order for the bowling to stop, in order for people to like me, in order for uh, life to go okay. So I would start with this drug and that drug and then um, not the different things. And and so by the time I was um, 16, I was uh, actually uh, going to commit suicide. My, my suicide was planned for the next day. Um, mm -hmm. Hunting is big there in Pennsylvania where I grew up. And so the plan was to go hunting the next day, uh, except I wasn't going hunting. 
and I had planned on taking my life while I was in the field. And I called, I called my good friend that I met in fourth grade and let her know what I was going to be doing, where I would be, and that she could let my family know where I was the next day. So nobody had to search for two weeks for me or anything. I just wanted to be, I wanted to end it, but didn't want to be uh, out there forever and leaving my family looking. And so she had a pretty candid conversation with me that night. Let me know how dumb I was and how selfish I was and how all I was doing was taking my pain and transferring it to the survivors, my family, my friends, who would carry it for another 40 years. Um, and so she was like, your pain doesn't go away. You just transfer it. And after a lengthy conversation, she said, you know, I better see you in school tomorrow. And I said, yeah, OK, whatever. Yeah. Um, but but again, at 16 and I was facing that, I uh, I. Honestly, I kept telling myself, if this is what life is, why do I need to live another 16 years and be 32? And why would I want to live another 16 years past that and be 48? And, and so that was, what, that was what was going through my mind when I wanted to commit suicide was, if this is what life is, then end it now, because no need to keep putting this on for the rest of your life. And so... um Obviously, you can tell that uh, I'm 38, so um, that's been what 22 years ago, mm -hmm. and you you can see that I'm still here. So I took my friend's advice, uh, and I went to school the next day, and and just tried to uh, to handle it and and withdraw from certain situations and and quit draw you know quit drawing attention to myself in certain ways and. Yeah. And then uh, I end up getting saved and uh, and yeah, just stay my life. So so that so then yes, how did I come it? I thought it was through drugs, alcohol, suicide. I thought that was how you ended it completely. Mm -hmm. um, but then it was in uh, June of that year. I had just turned 17 and I, I became a born again believer. And and accepted Jesus Christ as my savior. And since then, things have been a lot different. And I recognize that life is precious. Life is valuable. And we all have a purpose. And uh, and so now I just get a chance to share my story. And I'm excited to be on your program today to do that. Thank you. I'm honored that you've accepted. One hardships did you experience in your life? And what were some ways you overcame them? Um, so some of my hardships, honestly, was being that little, little kid. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, scripture tells us who can who can add a cubit to its stature. And and I wish I could. Right. I mean, I, even even at 38 years old, I'm only five foot seven. Mm -hmm. and, and that's if I really get the good measuring stick. Sometimes I come out five foot six. Yeah. And so I was always the little runt in, in school. I was, I was the easy target. I mean, I could, you know, I, I, uh, and, and let's face it, um, at 38 years old, I still have students that give me a hard time about my, my height because, uh, there's actually a, a fifth grader in the school that is eye to eye with me. And so there's a sixth grader that's taller. And so the joke is that Mr. Barker, uh, sure, sure can't even be as tall as his students. And so it's <laughs> always fun to, to joke with that. But so the hardship that I, you know, that was one of the hardships. And, and it really was just recognizing that I didn't choose how tall I was and I didn't choose uh, anything about my features. And, <laughs> and so I just learned to accept it and quit trying to be somebody that I wasn't. And that's what I was trying to do. I was always trying to be somebody that I wasn't. And I had to become comfortable with who I am. And I had to be comfortable with uh, understanding that, um, you know, scripture tells us that what good would it be if we were all the eye or if we were all the nose or if we were all the ear? You know, my, my eyes need my ears and my ears need my eyes and mm -hmm. my nose needs my mouth. And, and so 
we all need each other. And so I just had to become comfortable um, with who I am uh-huh. and, and understand. So, so one of the hardships would be that. And then another hardship, uh, if, if I mean, again, if I can consider it a hardship, but it was the fact that uh, being the size and being who I was, mm-hmm. uh, you know, nobody ever picked me for their team. Nobody ever um, thought that I would, you know, they, I was always the last one to be picked. I was always the last one for everything. And so, uh, again, once I got saved and realized, you know what, uh, I don't need to impress anybody and I don't need to be anybody that I'm not. And I can just continue to um, serve the Lord the best I can of who I am and and uh, be that person. Yeah, absolutely. How do you relieve a man's stress? Uh, well, so. Uh, several ways. Um, I would say the first thing I try to do is find out why I'm stressed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, sometimes I'm stressed because I put too much pressure on myself and, and uh, recognize that I'm trying to, to do things outside of what's being asked. And so I take a step back to make sure it's not me that's causing the stress. Mm -hmm. But then I, I remove myself also from stressful situations. So if I feel the stress is coming on, uh, just take a, a small break back. So let's say mm-hmm. it's a, let's say I'm trying to meet a deadline and I'm stressed out because I don't know if I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to meet that deadline or not. I've realized that if I would just take five minutes away from the situation and go get calmed down, go get refreshed and come back. I'm actually better mm-hmm. than when I just sat here for an hour trying to cram it in and rush it in. So I've learned how to take steps back. I've learned how to reevaluate the situation and why I am stressed. And then I've also learned that sometimes it's the fact that I just haven't had a break and I'm, I'm in this vicious cycle and feel like the hamster on the wheel and yeah. going 100 miles an hour and I'm not going anywhere. And so I enjoy um, finding a sporting event and, and just going to a sporting event and cheering and relaxing and just having a night out with the family mm-hmm. and to, to see that, hey, you know what? Life isn't all about whatever has me stressed, whatever has me worried, whatever has me burdened. Um, I, I, I tend to find my family and say, Hey, let's go spend time together because that's, I mean, life is precious and every day counts. And so I, I recognized, um, a long time ago from my overseer, uh, he meant, you know, that when, when his time comes and he's, uh, casket and people are at his funeral, Uh um, he doesn't want to be known for you know, the great overseer he was or the great pastor he was or how he ministered to people, but he wants to be known that he was a good husband to his wife and a good dad uh, to his children. And so when I get stressed out, I like to take a, so- I like to take a second and, and realize that, hey, why you do what you do mm-hmm. is for your family. Uh, why, you know, why you, you help. And so my family's important. And, uh, and so I find a lot of times I can relieve the stress as long as they're not the ones causing the stress. If they're the ones causing the stress, then I just take a step back. But uh-huh. uh, I like spend time with them. And when I'm at events like that, um, you know, things go away. And then, and then, and then secondly, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to bring the scripture in, but you know, when, when we, when we look up to the heavens from whence cometh our help and our help comes from the maker of the heavens and the earth, I realize that, you know what, it's not in my strength that I'm going to get anything accomplished anyways. And then we have the hymn that says, turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of this world were strangely dim. And so when I find myself stressed out, not only do I spend time with family, but I just sit there and say, Lord, uh, this thing has me burdened. This thing has me worried, but you know what, if, if, if I keep my eyes on you, this will just, this too shall pass and we'll overcome it. 
and we'll celebrate the victory when it when it's overcome. Yeah, no, absolutely. Do you have an, a favorite inspirational quote that sticks to you to never give up? Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I I love the book of Romans. I'm going to look down real quick because I mm -hmm. had it up here. Romans 8, 28 is one of my favorite verses that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. That was Romans 8, 28. Mm -hmm. to recognize that God works it out. Um, it doesn't matter what's going on right now. As long as I keep my my priorities on him and he's my first thing, things first, that, you know, all things are going to work together for good. I think of, I think of Joseph when he was sold, his brothers threw him in the pit and, and sold him into slavery. But, but God years later, Use Joseph to get the children of Israel to Egypt, and then from there we have them in Egypt, and Moses comes. But but he sent Joseph to Egypt and gave him favor in Egypt, knowing the famine was coming, and knowing that um, Jacob would need to send his sons there and knew that God knew that he, Joseph would be used to get the whole uh, Israel, all the people of Israel there during the famine. Mm -hmm. So for me, I recognize that, you know what, even if what I'm going through right now is not perfect or what I seem perfect, even though I wouldn't choose this hardship, I wouldn't choose this battle. Nonetheless, I find myself in it. And I know that God will work it out for good. I don't know when. I don't know how. In the moment, sometimes we get lost in what's happening. And we fail to see that, you know what, if you just give it time. I mean, I look back at my life now. Like, yeah, I mentioned how I was going to commit suicide mm -hmm. all those years ago. And when I look back now, I go, man, it wasn't even that bad. And, and then God has now used that over and over and over um, for good and, and helpful. And then secondly, right there from Romans as well, Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's one of my favorite passages when it comes even when I was born again. Mm -hmm. You know, even before I got saved and I was, you know, on that path of, of drugs and alcohol and other things, um, God saw it and, and didn't leave me, didn't, didn't allow me to follow through with something so permanent uh, in, in suicide, but then made me realize that even then God loved me. And even then he had a plan and a purpose and so for me, I love those two passages from, from Romans and looking at Paul's letters and, and just realizing that, hey, if you give it time, you will see the good in this. If you give it time, you will have that aha moment and realize that's why God allowed that to happen. That's why God permitted certain things to occur in our life. And, and when we have that aha moment, then we realize it was nothing that we did. But I, we, we recognize his sovereignty mm -hmm. and that he's in control of all things. Yeah, absolutely. One of your favorite music artists that helps you unwind? Um, I, I love the group Casting Crowns. Mm -hmm. um, they, they are a great Christian artist group. And, and the lead singer is a youth, was a youth pastor. And, and so when you listen to their songs, um, there's so much real life to them. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, uh, it's definitely not just a, a, a song that has just been made up or make you feel good or, but they're literally, you can tell that uh, they're using their life experiences and and bringing them to to the music industry and so um i love casting crowns and then 
Um, I mean, that's probably my favorite uh, group. I love Third Day. I know mm -hmm. that's not a, a modern day group, um, but they still have albums out there. And I love them, Newsboys. Um, and so I still, like I said, going old school, uh, but uh, I still have their CDs and love to, uh, to listen to them. Awesome. That's good. How have your experience affected your life long term, good or bad? Did those experiences change your goal or change the direction of your career? Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, so after I got saved, um, I, I, uh, signed up for the air force when I was a senior in high school mm -hmm. and with, with the full intention to be 20 years in service. And, and as a matter of fact, this would have been my 20th year. So I would have been, uh, I'd have made it, I'd have been retiring right now. And, mm -hmm. um, that was my, that was my plan going in. And I had a knee injury in high school, had some surgery on me. And uh, the my enter my my uh, physical uh, for the military uh, took me a, a few extra days than what it takes everybody else. They just wanted to make sure I could do certain things to pass the physical, and and I did. And uh, I was at Lackland Air Force Base in in um, July and August of two thousand and one, and. I injured it in basic training, and since it was a pre-existing condition, I was discharged and, and sent home. And so I, I remember, you know, going back home to Pennsylvania and, you know, realizing that my 20-year plan just came to a screeching halt in five weeks. Uh -huh. And uh, so I was, I was at home, and... Um, September the 11th happened. And so September the 11th would have been about two weeks after I returned home. Mm -hmm. And so there I was sitting on the couch and watching the news thinking, man, I wonder how much things have changed now. What, what would have happened? Where would my life go if, if I would have been uh, still in the air force? And, but I was, I was, I signed up to be a chap. Um, after I got born again, uh, about two weeks later, a, a group came back from Nicaragua and they had been on a mission trip and I thought it'd be great to go on a mission trip. And so I was on my first mission trip uh, just six months after being saved and, and I went to Nicaragua and it was there that I received the calling on my life. And, and so I thought I would fulfill that calling mm -hmm. by being a chaplain in the Air Force I mean, the yeah. whole the whole thing, uh, you know, going eventually my career would have been there. Mm -hmm. And and so now five weeks later, I'm at home and I'm like, well, man, what about that career? I thought I was going to be, you know, that's what, that's what I was going to do. And um, so I moved to Indiana. And when I moved to Indiana and get involved in church, um, I go into some youth ministry and I, I start the licensure process to be a licensed minister. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I had met an individual who uh, lived in Texas and um, she was going to come visit Indiana for Christmas that year. And so I went there for um, Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And while I'm in Texas, I sense that I'm the one supposed to move to Texas and not her to Indiana. and. Uh, I prayed about it, and I, I really did not want to move to Texas if I was moving just for a girl. And uh, so when I prayed, and the Lord kept that door open, uh, I moved in 2000. Uh, I moved at, at New Year of 03. So I was the very end of 02, and then I spent New Year, bringing the New Year in Texas. And so um, we had broken up. I don't know, shortly after I got to Texas. And and I simply realized, I said, Lord, I didn't move here for a girl. So there's something else here mm -hmm. um, that I'm supposed to do. And, and that's fine. And 
And uh, I came across a Bible college there in Fort Worth, Texas, mm -hmm. and I enrolled and spent two years there and got my associate degree in, in Bible and theology. And then I moved back to Indiana uh, to be the youth pastor and shared. And, and uh, I had met my wife during Bible college. I met my wife. And so when I moved back to Indiana, we dated and then we got married. And then I started pastoring. I got, I got the call to pastor a church in Connorsville, Indiana in 2007 at the age of 24 years old. And um, that was a big step to take. Um, you know, 24, I was born again for just seven years. Um, but I believe the Lord was opening that door. And so I walked through it and we pastored there for three years. Uh, before moving here to Abingdon. And now I've been here for 11. And then when I get here, um, <clears throat> besides pastoring, I worked at a couple of financial institutions mm -hmm. uh, before uh, being at the school. And now I'm at the school and I, and I see now where I get to help. Um, I get to help 12, you know, seventh grade. So 11, 12 year olds all the way through 18. I teach from seventh through 12th grade and, and have the chance just to help them understand life a little bit, uh, as their, as their teacher. And then as their, as their guidance counselor, I get to help them see what interests they have, see what opportunities are out there for career path and, mm -hmm. and help them get on that path. And so, um, it, it really, and, and, and I, and I think I am, you know, I think I'm only working with the seventh graders, but then, uh, at our campus, um, we have preschool in one building, elementary in another building and junior senior uh -huh. high in one building, but it's all the same property, just different buildings. And, um, just the other day, you know, had one of the elementary students say something to me and, and it made me realize that, Hey, even clear back in elementary elementary school they're paying attention to Miss Parker and I had that opportunity every single day to to speak into these individuals lives mm -hmm. um I tell them all the time I can I can sit here and name names of all kinds of teachers I had and that's my desire is that in 30 years when they're sitting around their dinner table talking to their children um they can if Mr. Barker is a name on their in their conversation then I've I've done my job well by helping them during this time of life. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I see where all these, all these uh, events in life have led us to where we are today and that, that I get the chance. And so I know I'll, I'll finish out this question with the fact that I was, I was eating at a restaurant recently where um, the manager there is one of my former students and he was in one of my leadership elective classes and what, not just one, I think he took two of them. So mm -hmm. for two years, he took my leadership elective and, and I, so his back was to me, but I recognized him and, and, uh, and I knew he had worked there and he had a, he had a different color. He had a different color polo on than everybody else. So I knew, and I knew he was the manager. So I, mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, you know, Hey, is that you? And he goes, Mr. Barker, how's it going? I said, it's going good. I see you're wearing a, I see you're wearing a different color polo. Does that, does that mean what I think it does? He said, yeah, man, I've been a manager here for, and he how long he's been a manager. And he said, but you know what? He said, I use a lot of quotes that I got from your class. And I still use a lot of your class in what I'm doing here to help others and inspire others here. And he goes, I just want you to know uh, it stuck with me and I'm using it. And, and you know what? Um, I ate my lunch that day there with, with such joy, um, with such uh, humbleness um, to realize that if, if, if I would have killed myself at the age of 16, none of these things would have happened since. And so I look back and I, I keep thanking God that all these opportunities have happened and that these students, you know, I'm, I've now been there for five years. I've watched four graduating classes. This was my fifth one to watch graduate. Mm -hmm. And uh, and seeing what they do with their life um, is is so encouraging. Uh, we I'm getting ready to take a trip in December 
down to Arizona. We partner with the Grand Canyon University, and I have two students there right now. Awesome. So I'm looking forward to headed to Arizona. When it's cold, and we're gonna watch a basketball game together. Take some of our students down there to see the campus. But yeah, uh, yeah. So I, you know, I get a chance every day to look at this my my past, and and use it for God's glory and to help others mm -hmm. um, that might be struggling to realize that life has a purpose and uh, God can use anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If any of you are thinking about committing suicide, talk to a family member, talk to a trusted person that you feel comfortable because your life is important. Amen. Amen. Anyways, Jeremiah, is there anything that you would like to discuss or let anyone know about anything about staying strong in life if they think they are afraid of not doing anything? Is there any advice yeah. you would like to say? Yeah, I, I always tell, you know, people, um, and I was guilty of it, right? We, we tend to look at life two inches from our face mm -hmm. and, and, you know, how dangerous it would be if we were driving our cars at 70 miles an hour down the road and we were just watching two dotted lines ahead of us. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you're, you're, your head is down and all you see is, is what, two feet. Uh, at 70 miles an hour, that is uh, very dangerous. Well, I learned uh, and, and, and I'm sure you have too, Waylon, that uh, the older we get, the faster time goes. And, and I remember being a kid and hearing that. I'm like, yeah, whatever. 24 uh -huh. hours is 24 hours. I mean, it's a day is a day. Yep. But I do recognize the older we get, man, the more that we're, you know, we're just busy and, and time. It's like, man, where did these time go? Yep. So here's my point that um, when we look at life just two inches in front of our face, we tend to see the problems. We tend to see, um, you know, whether it's a financial issue, whether it's a loss of a job, mm -hmm. whether it's a loss of a family member, whether it's a problem in the home, mm -hmm. whatever it may be, we tend to think, well, this is it. There's, there's no way I can get past this. There's no way, there's no way good can come out of this or anything like that. And and uh, we, we fail to see two months ahead or three months ahead. But I've come to recognize in my life that, you know, we, we, we find out in the book of Jeremiah that before we were formed in our mother's belly, God knew us and he had a plan for us. Mm -hmm. And so and he should he should he tarry and, and Christ wait another 50 years to return. He's already in 2071. He he knows no time. Mm -hmm. And so if there's anybody out there struggling, you might not be like, well, I don't, I'm not thinking about suicide. I'm just depressed and I'm just down about this and I'm down about that. I, I'm encouraging you tonight to realize that God will turn it for good. You just got to look on down the road. You have to look and say, you know what? Yeah, you know, the, 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 there are there are hard seasons of life. There are hard times in life, but God is faithful to get us through them all. And, and today's hardship, today's problems, today's trials are tomorrow's victories and our tomorrow's testimonies. Uh, but we have to, we have to remain strong, you know, staying, standing strong. We have to remain strong mm -hmm. and realize that if we want victory, we have to face the battle and the victory is always sweeter the hard it was to get it. Absolutely. Amen. Well, Jeremiah, it was an honor to have you on my show. Remember to always be well, honest, and inspiring. I hope you have a good rest of your day. God bless. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Bye, everyone. Catch you all next week on another episode of Standing Strong with Waylon. There you have it, everyone. You have just watched Standing Strong with Waylon Myers. Follow the show on social media 
on Twitter at SSW Waylon Myers, on Instagram, Standing Strong with Waylon Myers, and on Facebook, Standing Strong with Waylon Myers. For everything Standing Strong with Waylon Myers, visit the official website at waylonmyers.com. Until next week, everyone. Thank you for watching.